to the first edition of the virtual Eric Miskell Show of 2021. I'm Eric Miskell, the publisher of EMS Now. I hope you all enjoyed your holidays with your families and your loved ones and are ready for what hopefully will be a better year in 2021. I'd like to welcome back my co-host, Phil Stoughton of Scoop, who will be joining me again this year as we speak to various industry people about issues impacting the electronics manufacturing services industry. Our focus today on this inaugural one is the uh, EMS industry in Europe. So to help us in that, we have invited back a few colleagues from Europe who can lend us some insight in that area. So our guest today, as you will see, is uh, Rainer Kolpitz, the CEO of Katek Group, a uh, leading EMS based out of Germany, and Hedita Weiss, the consultant and market researcher extraordinaire for, with Informa. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to you both, and I want to thank you, too, for taking time away from your Tag der Heiligen Drei Könige festivities oh, to participate. So, uh, I think I look back, and the last time the four of us shared a stage was over a year ago. It was at Protoktronica in Munich back in 2019, mm -hmm. um, and a lot has certainly happened since then, right? Wow, yeah. But let me begin, I think the best way to begin these is always to allow you to introduce yourselves. So Raina, why don't we begin with you to introduce yourself and your organization for our audience, please. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm Reiner, I'm Reiner Koppitz. Um, you know, I'm uh, the CEO and president of uh, the Katek Group based uh, in Munich. Um, we are a European um, EMS um, company uh, with uh, something like 2,500 uh, employees, uh, 12 sites um, uh, all over uh, Europe, mostly in uh, Germany and in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and, um, you know, we will have a turnover this year of approximately 400 uh, million um, euro. Excellent. And Dita. Yeah, my name is Dieter Weiss. Uh, I am the managing director of Informa, a market research company. I'm trustee for the electronics industry over here in Europe. And I consider myself the uh, ambassador for the European EMS industry. Yes, you are. I think it's a that's role a, as well. That's a big job, Dieter. Yeah. Hey, Dita, Someone has to do it. let's start with you. Why don't you kind of set the table for us here and uh, by giving us an update on, on the market over there, you know, what are the real numbers? You know, what impact did the pandemic have in 2020 and, and where do we stand kind of the industry stand as we're heading into 2021? Well, let me just uh, issue my numbers for starting with Germany. Uh, we'll probably see a decline in the revenues uh, for Germany of about 8.2% uh, in 2020. Uh, you might wonder that I give you the first digit after the, the dot, but uh, it is possible because I just did a, a survey for the third quarter. So I actually do have uh, figures for the first three quarters of 2020 already. Uh, and on top predictions for the fourth quarter, which allow me to make very accurate statements uh, over here. So Germany will be minus 8.2 percent, and uh, uh, I am starting this week with a survey, with the annual survey again, uh, which will uh, hopefully confirm uh, the results of the third quarter survey. For Germany, Austria, and Switzerland combined, it will be uh, a minus of 7.7%. And uh, this is positively uh, influenced by the superior development of uh, uh, two big uh, EMS companies in Switzerland, uh, which uh, pushed Switzerland only to a minus of 1.9%. So uh, that lifted. Uh, the uh, lower uh, numbers for Austria of more than 9% minus and Germany of 8.2% minus to a total for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland to 7.7%. Now, 
Uh, looking at Scandinavia in, in full, uh, we do see an increase of 2.2% that, that might wonder because uh, uh, we all had uh, problems with Corona, but uh, uh, one thing is different in Scandinavia, they have a much lower dependence upon the automotive industry and the biggest problem in 2020 had been the automotive industry uh, and they have uh, uh, and I have to repeat this. I said that in the interview in December already with you, uh, that there was a dependence of the uh, automotive share on the revenue decline. Uh, people who were doing, uh, let's say, 70 to 80 percent uh, of their revenues in the automotive industry, they did have uh, uh, a decline in the revenues of 25 to 28 uh, percent which is hurting a lot. And to some companies, uh, this uh, could be life-threatening. Now, uh, uh, this 2.2% plus in Scandinavia uh, is caused by uh, the few automotive uh, applications they manufacture there. They have uh, had other sectors which were much healthier. Um, and that caused Western Europe in all uh, to only have a minus of 7.7%. And uh, we all know that France, UK, and Italy uh, were affected much harder, but due to the fact that Scandinavia had a positive impact, it pushed uh, down the numbers to minus 7.7%. Now, Eastern Europe is much more difficult to predict because we have some very uh, big players over there like Foxconn, Vistron, Inventec, Flex, Jabil, Sunminer. And uh, these companies are, for me as a market researcher, more or less unpredictable because uh, they um, might uh, have strategic transfers of product to other facilities. We have seen that in the past, uh, Jabil moving a product. Uh, uh, to uh, from Austria to the Ukraine, uh, but they might as well move products out to, to the Far East, who knows? And that uh, is a big problem for me as a researcher. At the moment, my forecast for Eastern Europe stands at uh, plus 1.1%, which is influenced, for example, by Romania, where we do see uh, a plus of more than 4%, and that is mainly due to the fact that, for example, there is Plexus uh, in Romania, uh, heavily involved in medical equipment, and they have uh, had uh, a very good year uh, in 2020 uh, in the medical industry. So, uh, uh, counting all of that up, we get to an average of minus 3.2% for Europe, for uh, uh, 2020, which is not all that bad. Yeah? But again, I have to, to say it could still change uh, depending on what the big guys are uh, going to, or what they did uh, uh, last year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you know, what I'm, what I'm curious about is, is there have been some, some companies bucking those trends and certainly Catec has been one and we'll come we'll come to that Reina in a second but Dieter I was curious about the Scandinavian EMS companies and uh, someone's asked me are there particular verticals that they've been more successful in that have um, given them given them growth opportunities that have stood out you mentioned medical are there any others uh, yeah, well, there is big companies like Keytron in Norway, there is uh, Initium, uh, Note, uh, and Orbit One in Sweden, there yeah. is Incap in, in Finland, uh, those are, are the big players over there, and uh, well, uh, I don't have the numbers in my head, I only remember that I looked at them uh, for the half year results uh, yeah. and for the three quarter results like uh, Node and Keytron. Both they doing very were not well. only able to improve uh, uh, or increase their revenues, but as well uh, uh, the bottom line uh, was yeah. uh, uh, improved. So yeah. it is still possible with the right approach to make good profits in this industry. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, one would hope so. One would hope that's why you're there, Reina. Um, <laughs> what 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 were the what were the impacts? What were the impacts like specifically for for Catech, and how have you coped through the crisis? Yeah, Phil. I mean, it it, it has been a very very uh, a bumpy year, uh, uh, to be honest. We had a very good start, uh, like uh, many of our competitors, uh, into the first quarter uh, 2020. Very, very good start. Uh, March was a brilliant month. But then, you know, in April, uh, we had a big, big, big crash. And, uh, you know, the, the, revenues, the revenues decreased by something like uh, 22%. And if you have this uh, kind of uh, fixed cost base, like uh, like like it's used in our industry, that's a big big problem. So you really have to cut deep, uh, very very fast, in order uh, not to get into uh, real problems. Um, and then you know um, the, the May was um, you know a little bit better, so it was a very fast recovery. Um, and from June onwards, um, you know, we uh, were on the uh, March level or even beyond. Um, so it was a very, very far. It was kind of the famous V shape, yeah. um, which we hoped initially, yeah. but of course there was uh, no certainty. Um, and I mean, then August, September, October, November, and even December um, have been has been the the, the best month uh, of the of, of the history of the of the company in terms of, of of revenue. So, all in, I would say it was a very very challenging year for mm. everybody in the company, the management, the employees, the customers, the suppliers. But um, at the end of the day, we had a organic growth. So that's I think the number we have to compare. Yeah numbers like the Western Europe minus 7.7 percent and I think uh, those are the right numbers um, you know if I look into Catech the organic growth will end up with something like I mean double digit uh, more than 10 percent 10 yeah more than 10 percent um, and um, you know because we are also growing uh, uh, you know very fast uh, due to uh, some acquisitions if I um, you know put all in then the overall growth will be something like uh, 50%, 53 yeah. to, be, to be exact. So that's that, that's great. But for us, the the, the interesting number, um, of course, is the double-digit uh, organic growth. Yeah. And the reason the reason for that is, honestly speaking, that um, I, I think in this year it was extremely important to have a very healthy and solid uh, industry and, and customer mix. So if you are dependent from two or three customers and one of them is struggling, you are dead. If uh, you are purely focusing on, let me say, uh, automotive, um, I mean, in this year, 2020, then you are, then you are dead. If you don't have a, a, a of course, if you're a yeah. family business, and uh, they insert a lot of fresh money, then everything is okay. But a normal company um, yeah. would have had uh, um, tremendous uh, problems there. So that's the first reason. So the business uh, mix, which is a very healthy one. The second one is that we had some larger projects which, uh, which have been in the, in the ramp up phase. So uh, the ramp up phase, uh, then I mean, some somehow is compensating uh, some weaker uh, projects and customers because the, the the ramp up phase in those projects, for for example, um, uh, e-mobility projects, and the, the ramp up phases, they were, I would say, much slower than originally planned and expected. But I mean, still, um, if you if you triple the revenue in such a revenue from let me say one project from uh, 7 million to uh, more than 30 million within one year because it was just the ramp up phase. I mean, that's compensating a lot of the other uh, weaker uh, uh, businesses, of course. And then, the, the, and then I think the third reason why we've made it uh, a pretty good through the crisis is that um, although we are a large company, right now, um, uh, based on uh, the uh, number of employees and based mm. on, on, 
on the turnover, we are structured, I would say, in a in a very in a very um, uh, in in a very uh, flexible and very agile way. As yeah. we are more, um, you know, a, a fleet of of, of um, semi-independent uh, speedboats, which yeah. can react very very fast on what is happening in their specific markets so we had uh, so we had companies in our fleet where i mean we were hiring dozens of people uh you know also in april and in may where everything else um you know was laying off people um and we had other parts um of our uh, of our group where um we massively reduced um uh, you know the 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 labor cost massively yeah. Um, you know, in April and May, and uh, in some of the subsidiaries uh, over the entire um, you know period of summer, uh, because uh, they were heavily dependent from uh, automotive, classical automotive, yeah. and of course we needed to react there. So this um, this flexible structure we are we are, we are having and we are relying on gives us the possibility with the local management to react very very fast yeah. and just following some central guidelines we all have to let me say save cost right now because it's crisis and then everything save cost even the companies uh, which uh, need to invest into growth in order to deliver to the custom, cu customers the maximum volume so that's the the third element which i think was very yeah. very um, uh, helpful for us and the fourth one is um, due to our dna we are a very lean company in the best sense so um, every group member is is very lean in terms of uh, management in terms of overhead in terms of you know how we spend the money yeah. how much marketing resources etc and as we decided to add all those lean companies to one group and not to add the massive headquarters which is then yeah. destroying all this leanness i mean yeah. this helped a lot as well as uh, we also can survive for, um, you know, uh, and, and, and no single month this year, we've been uh, EBITDA negative. Every single okay. month, EBITDA positive, and this helped us a lot. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a really fascinating story. And I wanted to come back to the acquisitions in a moment, because I know you did one at the start of the year and one at the end of the year, and they must have been very different experiences. But I wanted to just ask you, Dita, when you look at what happened at KTEC, uh, KTEC and you look at the, um, for example, Note and some of those Scandinavian companies that did quite well, GPV, um, do you see common factors that have made them perhaps perhaps more resilient and more successful than other than other companies is there something in that they have in common that you see as a you know perhaps a lesson that others can learn well i think one important factor for sure first of all is cash uh, without cash there is nothing and mm -hmm. uh, you need to be able nowadays to uh, uh, do something for inorganic growth uh, of your company. And we've seen that uh, in several uh, uh, cases this year, we have seen, for example, INCAP, who uh, bought AWS in the UK and in uh, Slovakia. Uh, Katek, for sure, was outstanding uh, uh, in uh, the latest acquisition, uh, which still has to have a closing uh, of uh, uh, lasers, but before that there was uh, Hoof, uh, there was uh, Bebro and Bflex, and now uh, they are uh, setting up a new facility of Bflex in, in Hamburg. Um, it is very, very uh, exciting to just watch uh, mm. how fast Kartec is moving in this market, and it seems nothing can stop them. Um, well, we all know that revenues is not the only uh, issue here. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, there is uh, uh, substantial profits as well. And uh, as I said, it uh, companies like uh, Node, Keytron, um, but others, even in Germany, they show us a way. We have people who have an 
uh, EBIT rate of 25%. Yeah. Mm. So uh, we need to look into that. We need to yeah. compare and we need to see uh, what can be done different. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if we don't do that, if we lean back and if we think, well, uh, it's just a bad market, then forget about it. Uh, go home if you think it's just a bad market. Yeah? Yeah. Um, you're useless if you, you think that. Or uh, I had uh, a guy telling me this uh, year that the EMS market in Europe was saturated. And I thought, well, saturated, how come? 64% of all uh, PCBAs are still manufactured by OEMs. OEMs, yeah. And yeah, uh, as long as that is the case, uh, we have no saturated market. Yeah. We have yeah. a challenge. We have a challenge to convince the uh, OEMs that it's far too expensive uh, for them to manufacture themselves. Uh, and they should look into um, the Absolutely. EMS professionals to yeah. help them uh, make better profits by transferring production uh, to to the EMS industry, and yeah. uh, um, that is uh, the thing. And uh, uh, regarding Cartec, I can only say uh, it's not just the size that defines uh, a company; it's the people. Yeah, uh, you need to have good people. And uh, when I look at the uh, management team of Cartec. I can uh, uh, really definitely say they have gotten a very good team of professionals together uh, mm -hmm. from di all different kind of companies. Yeah? They, uh, they looked uh, who the good ones were and were able to convince them to join the team. And yeah. that is part of their success. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's often about people, Eric. Now, hey, listen, and Ryan, I wanna follow up on, uh, and or pick up on the M&A piece here because there was quite a bit of activity that and it's and even at the end of the year when you know DTAC can list who those are but uh, and then we see some of that even over here in North America right so what's driving that is that the is that you know you you mentioned the term saturated there DTA. you know the the MS industry historically has always been challenged by having just an overabundance of small people. And so the consolidation getting bigger to be more relevant and, uh, and, and to be more customer service oriented is, is certainly been a trend, but is, is this opportunistic as well as strategic for you, Raina? How, how, how is that market over there? For yeah, on, on, I mean, honest, honestly speaking, um, I would, I would uh, uh, divide our M&A journey in, uh, in, two, in two phases, or maybe, maybe even in three phases. The very beginning was, um, this was, uh, the beginning was with the, the Steka group in 2017. Mm -hmm. this, was, uh, this was about, I would say, trial and error. Um, this was about learning, is this an interesting industry? Is this something we can, we can build on, okay? Um, this was the first phase, and I would say also the acquisition of um, the electronics uh, uh, subsidiary of the Katrine Group, uh, the the Katek in Grasau and Hungary was part of this of this phase. So um, th then, the, then the second phase was um, to very very quickly uh, uh, be, get some decent uh, volume due to, due, due to two reasons. First reason, of course, is you need to, um, you need to be on the same level uh, like your customers. So they need to see that you are stable, that you are there for play um, also for the next three to five to 12 to 10 years. Um, and, and secondly, what you need is, what you need is you need uh, very simply in our industry, you need fertility power. Um, so second phase was to very, very quickly get to the necessary volume. So in this phase, of course, it was a little bit um, opportunistic because it doesn't make sense if you want to gain very quick volume. It doesn't make sense to look around for the 100% uh, Mr. Perfect. Uh, I mean, that, uh, uh, that's uh, taking too much, uh, too much time. So, uh, of course, it was a mixture of 
is it the right company? Is it is it profitable? Um, do we think they have a good management? Uh, but also on the second side, is it available? So are they are they are they on sale? Um, is their owner, um, you know, being um, uh, be, being able or being willing to negotiate with us and sell the company? Um, so this was the this was the second phase. And I mean, right now, this began end of last year. We are in the in the third phase, and the third phase is uh, all wrapped around um, acquiring some, uh, let me say, mis missing links, uh, knowledge, uh, customers in certain industry where we think we have some gaps. So that's wrapped around engineering. It's wrapped around not only doing E Square MS, but also. Uh, serving those customers who want more, like uh, complete uh, complete systems, for example, including box building, including some parts of, of development, um, and and then and then of course um, you know there's the aspect that Dieter just mentioned, which is also part of this, let me say, third phase uh, in our um, acquisition strategy, and that's the and, and that's the what I would call the um, uh, conquer the uh, captive market part. Which is which is outsourcing, um, like like Dieter said. I mean, 64 percent. That's almost two thirds of the market, yeah. and still in the hands of the of the OEMs. I mean, if you compare this with uh, the IT industry, and I had the honor to work many years in the IT industry, like for Dell, for example. Um, you know, I can I can tell you it's the same situation the IT industry um, you know was in something like 40 years ago, 40 yeah. years ago. Or zero, um, where every company, uh, you know, was running uh, their own data centers. They had their own mm -hmm. IT groups. Um, I mean, and this was normal. And then, you know, some uh, companies like uh, Big Blue, like IBM, they started to say, "Hey, that's not normal. I can do this for this. Um, give me this. I'm doing it better. I'm doing this for less money because I'm specialized on those kind of things." And so, this outsourcing and, and being, you know. A stable, reliable partner with all the tool sets in order to make those complex outsourcing deals to take over yeah. uh, the machines, um, you know, to 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 keep the the, the quality on a very high uh, level. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of these because they are then absolutely dependent from you. If they have yeah. their own electronics factory, like uh, the first deal in this year, which was uh, Hoof Electronics. Um, I mean, it was their electronic factory where all the electronics, for example, for the for the Daimler door lock systems uh, have been produced, and then they put it in the in the entire system. So if we if we if we fail, uh, if we mess this up, they are dead. Yeah. So, so yeah. outsourcing has a lot to do not only with cost but also with trust. So yeah. And why, and that's why we think we are perfectly positioned in order to go to the uh, German uh, Mittelstand and uh, other parts of the European industry uh, and convince them in order to hand over their electronics development and production, but of course uh, uh, production to uh, the Catech group. And then from there in a very, very close partnership, it's not just supplier and customer, mm. we then can together uh, uh, do much, much, much more at a better cost position, but also in terms of quality, in terms of in terms of innovation. So that's yeah. that, that's three phases in our uh, M and A journey, and we are now in the middle of phase three. And if you just look into the last um, three acquisitions we've done, uh, 2020. The first one was uh, in in March, just at the beginning of the crisis. The uh, the, the outsourcing deal, taking over uh, all of the electronics uh, uh, production from from Hoof in Düsseldorf. So this was the first one. Uh, the second one was more, uh, let me say, uh, smaller secret one. Nobody is really aware of. Uh, closing was at the beginning of uh, December. We took took over from a, a cement subsidiary. Uh, called Kako, uh, we, we took over uh, the development team, a complete uh, product in the inverter range, something mm -hmm. that closed the gap. Um, also with the know-how, the hardware, the software, um, we took over um, uh, this. It was a smaller but very strategic transaction in order to fill a gap in the uh, re renewable space uh, which we had. 
Um, and then the last one was the, uh, the leases in uh, leases group in Leipzig, where we, um, uh, like you rightly said, uh, just had the um, uh, signing one day before mm -hmm. uh, Christmas. And uh, uh, most probably the closing will be, uh, it will be at the beginning of, uh, of, of, of the year, but you know, I think it will be 1st of February, something like this. Yeah. Also depends uh, from the um, you know, antitrust uh, uh, authorities in Europe, of course. And I mean, this one is, is wrapped around uh, this factory and also the subsidiaries. They are very, uh, they are very, um, uh, they are very skilled in uh, developing and, and manufacturing complete, uh, complete systems, complete devices. Uh, they're also doing their own, uh, you know, plastics there. Um, and this is because of their history that they manufactured all the telephone systems for, for Siemens. Um, you know, everything, mm -hmm. including box build, etc., displays. So this was the, uh, this was the, the roots of this company. Um, and in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, they conquered a lot of very promising customers in the IoT arena, in the uh, e-mobility charging arena. I just said the uh, the latest yeah. numbers for uh, the first quarter. I mean, it's very very promising in terms of the electronics for one of the leading charging uh, um, public charging station uh, uh, suppliers in Germany. Uh, that's very promising, and they have. That they have a, they have a daughter company in Switzerland call, uh, called the Tele Alarm, and they are doing hardware and, and software complete systems uh, for uh, elderly people and for people with uh, disabilities in order to allow them uh, to have a uh, to have a self determined uh, life like nurse calls uh, for for okay. example. Um, yeah. That's a very very uh, uh, smart business as well. And it's falling more into this uh, section of what we call uh, internally high value electronics, which is yeah. more than just, uh, uh, you know, the contract manufacturing of e -square MS. So that's yeah. the, the logic behind those acquisitions these years and, and more to come uh, next year. Wow. Exciting times. Just before we move on from M&A and we look at some other stuff, Dieter, when you look forward, do you think there's going to be more opportunist M&A? Do you think there are companies that are looking to take advantage of, you know, companies that have cash that are looking to take advantage where companies are struggling and are there other companies that just need to sell to survive? Yes, there is a high level of M&A activity at the moment. Um, there are several companies for sale Mm -hmm. uh, not openly, but quietly. Yeah. Uh, there are companies uh, looking to acquire uh, someone uh, in order to have inorganic growth because they uh, know that they are too small. Um, in order to have purchasing power, and this is, if you look at it, uh, having uh, a material percentage of more than 60% of your revenues, you need to have purchase power. Yeah. Without this power, uh, you're totally dependent upon your suppliers and mm. uh, people realize that. Yeah. Now, the only problem is they need cash uh, in order to be able to uh, do an acquisition. Uh, the other point is I, I've spoken uh, with a group of companies, uh, smaller companies and uh, got them uh, on the table and they said, listen, you should now talk together and uh, build a purchasing group uh, mm. in the first place. And in the second uh, step, you can uh, talk about uh, uh, having a common marketing uh, and not being seen as, uh, uh, let's say, 10 individual companies, each uh, having revenues of 10 to 15 million euros. But um, you, uh, 10 companies, have combined revenues of uh, more than 100 million and uh, become interesting for yeah. uh, an OEM. So um, there are a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Uh, uh, you need uh, to look over the fence uh, in order to uh, uh, be able to have a, a survival strategy or not only a survival strategy, but a strategy going forward. And 
uh, improve your uh, situation and uh, make a reasonable living. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You need to, um, as you say, look over the fence, but it's been one of the uh, one of those years where there's so much trouble in your own backyard that um, looking outside and, and exploring new ideas is, is very, very challenging for uh, for some people. Hey, Phil, let me let me I want to come back to the 64 percent because I think there's the great opportunity within Europe. Right. And I, and I want to just kind of get your ideas as to, you know, we've talked about a few things here, uh, you know, the OEMs in detail, you and I spoke about this uh, last month or so about, you know, the impression that some, some people aren't aware of the EMS industry, which, you know, I found amazing in this day and age, but you said that's actually very true. Um, so what, let's talk about that, that 64% of that's a, an available market, right? Your, your, your total available market that's still out there, which is kind of sizable. What is holding that back? Something in, I noticed in North America, if we look back over the last few decades, part of that was, you know, uh, maintaining a, uh, their kingdom, right? And there's purchasing power within that, but there's also that control and they, they, they don't, uh, you used the word, word trust, Reina, before, that it's just not about cost, it's about trust. It's that willingness to let go of that and trust that an outside entity mm. will serve that as well as you and cherish that as well as you do inside. Um, and as part of that, maybe as it's loosening up, that maybe the graying of management, there's some you know people getting older moving on and maybe some younger people coming in who are more open to, to this? Or how do you see this kind of evolving in the next few years? And how does that play out? This was a question to, uh, for Dieter or for me? Uh, That's for you first, but I want both of you on. <laughs> OK. I mean, I can, uh, I can give you some insights how um, we are you know, attacking this market. Um, basically, uh, because I mean, 64%, that, that means you can uh, almost go into every uh, you know, city and knock at the doors of every uh, company wow. and say, look, give me some electronics. So that, that's not a promising approach as we are lean and have not uh, you know, hundreds of people on the street in the sales department. So we need to find some other uh, ideas here. And uh, what, what, we are, what we are doing basically is we are uh, working with um, databases and uh, some kind of uh, artificial intelligence, meaning that we are defining some compelling events which make it more likely that at the end of the day, the management of this company is thinking about uh, outsourcing something. For example, if you have a, just to give a few, if you have a, if you have a company um, which still has their uh, own, I mean, electronics production. And all of a sudden, uh, this company has a project with a top uh, restructuring consultancy, like with Roland Berger, for example, mm -hmm. or they have a chief restructuring officer, then uh, there, there seems to be some need uh, for improvement. Um, and they are looking into all uh, parts of the company and looking for a solution. Now, this could be the right moment in order to enter into the CXO door um, and uh, talk to them. One example. Another example is if you have uh, if you have family-based businesses and they are growing very 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 fast, and you read in the newspapers that uh, they are looking for a new facility in order for the uh, final assembly of their, of their devices, et cetera, et cetera. And we have one of those examples close to Stuttgart where the basic, the basic reason to outsource this to us was simply space because it was the, it was the question whether they have to build uh, a new factory to do their own core business or uh, to outsource the electronics production and use the, the space for what they normally do. It was in the machinery industry. So that's also kind of a compelling event where if you, if you think about it uh, in a clever way, you can find those, um, let me say, inflection points and then look uh, with big databases and artificial, artificial intelligence um, exactly for those uh, companies and then you address them. And um, you know that's what we've what we've um, what we've uh, been piloting, 
uh, during now the Corona crisis, because many also of our salespeople, they had a lot of time and we've set this up, this project. And now in 2021, uh, I think we are there uh, to harvest some of the fruits and some very interesting targets are, you know, still in the, in, in the, in the nets. Okay. So, so Dita, how do you see the, that 64 becoming 50% over the next few years? How, how does, what's going to drive that? Well, I definitely think uh, this is the right decade uh, to uh, move forward in, in that respect. We, uh, are see, we are seeing two major trends. One is uh, the uh, big OEMs have to rethink their profit lines. Uh, and they have to uh, find ways to improve the profit lines. And uh, you just need to look over the ocean to, to America, what, what Apple did and many other companies, Hewlett Packard. Uh, none of these companies are manufacturing the products themselves. Yeah? They leave it up to, to uh, uh, a manufacturing service company to manufacture the product for them. And at the end of the day, they have a lower risk and a much improved bottom line. So uh, this is something, uh, I told you this story about Terry Gao last month, who uh, 30 years ago uh, walked uh, or uh, went from one OEM in the United States to the other, uh, had them show him uh, the products and without doing any calculation said, I do it for 20% less. Yeah. Now today, Hon Hai is the world's biggest o uh, ODM and EMS company. And that is the success uh, story of Terry Gao. Mm -hmm. And there is no reason why uh, other EMS companies can't copy this. Yeah? Uh, I always say, uh, go out to potential customers and tell them you can do it for 20% less. Because most of those OEMs have a, a much uh, higher overhead structure. They have a lot of overhead costs which are useless yeah? Uh, yeah. Or, or which could uh, be better used for uh, improving the marketing of their products, uh, selling yeah, product, product development yeah. and product marketing. Uh, so this is a decade uh, where we're gonna see more uh, OEM companies uh, handing over the production to the EMS. And yeah. on top of that, we do see what is called reshoring, reshoring, uh, or let's let's say the resyncing as well, a resyncing of uh, the supply chain, uh, uh, no matter whether it's China or any other uh, country, especially countries uh, which have uh, political uh, instable systems, we should be very careful uh, to select uh, companies in such uh, countries as a supplier, or at least we should never uh, allow uh, a single country to be uh, a single supplier. That doesn't work. Now, big uh, companies, big EMS uh, companies, and uh, Catec, for example, is one of them. They have uh, the flexibility to move products uh, from one facility to the other, depending whether uh, they have a, a better technical equipment over there or whether they have uh, uh, lower cost. Yeah, let's just uh, take Kartec in Bulgaria. Yeah, uh, Kartec in Bulgaria has grown tremendously over the last couple of years, uh, and I can uh, tell you, Kartec Bulgaria is definitely competitive to to Far East. Yeah, so and and it is if you you have to look at the overall cost not just uh, at the cost of the product but you have to look at the soft costs uh, transportation and all of that yeah, yeah. and yeah. that is the second mega trend we're going to see a reshoring um, closer to the consumers 
There you go. Dieter, I've just written down 2020 is Europe's decade of outsourcing. Uh, that's an article you and I are going to co-write after this after this <laughs> show. But I think I think there's a really fundamental point that comes through. And 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 you mentioned you mentioned the term risk. Hasn't 2020 taught us that it's a really good time to have variable costs, not fixed costs? Uh, and if you're outsourced, you've got variable costs of production. You know, you manufacture less, you pay Rainer less. You manufacture more, you pay Rainer more. Um, suddenly the market changes, Rainer deals with that for you. So um, I think that that agility for the OEM, providing you can be that trusted partner and take care of their product properly for them, um, combined with the fact that you're shifting um, fixed cost into variable product costs must be must be hugely valuable to them. So I, you know, I, I see that as something that um, twenty twenty would have certainly certainly highlighted. Can I piggyback off that? Sorry, Eric. No, I just want to piggyback. I think that is only if the OEM how they structure their outsourcing, because I think everybody. Yeah. That, like you're saying, that transactional cost, but then there's still that OEM internal spend to support their yeah. outsourcing initiative. Yeah. And what we learned with a lot of big OEMs in the United States is they outsource the function, but kept all the staff, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And their internal costs were just overwhelming to, to what the relationship was, and they had to work that out. So hopefully yeah. Europe in the process learns from that mistake and you know, is smarter about it as they move forward. Well, that's right. And as Dita says, there are some great examples of, of EMSs that have done a great, a great job in blazing the trail, but there are also examples of OEMs that have done a really good job in managing their, managing their outsourcing process and making sure they actually not just get rid of skills they don't need, but keep some very important skills they do need um, you know, to, properly, to properly manage their outsourcing. Go I know forward. you were trying to say something there, and I interrupted you. I'm sorry. But the only thing I, I wanted to, to reiterate, uh, you know, based on what you just said, is that, I mean, all the arguments to do outsourcing, they are crystal clear. You know, from an economic point of view, mm. turning uh, 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 fixed costs into variable costs, um, you, 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 uh, in, innovation, you have to invest every year, uh, which doesn't make sense to them. So all of those things are pretty clear and normally it takes something like 10 minutes in order uh, to bring this message across the big big problem is the the risk associated with uh, with this uh, transfer uh, of, of, of the assets the risk not to have and, and electronics is the heart of everything and to give this uh, to give this to an external partner there's a big risk associated to this. And then also the big risk is sitting on the shoulders of the decision makers. So, and that's the, and that's the reason why I'm overstating always that, I mean, to balance this risk, you need a trustful partner. You need to build, um, you know, in the, in, in, in the talks, in the negotiation, in, in, in the entire approach, you need to build a trust level so that at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the customer is prepared to jump into the deep and cold water. And that's yeah. the, the essence of this business. It's yeah. Trust business. Yeah. And we've seen situations in the past and examples in the past, perhaps in the, particularly in the 90s, where, you know, facilities were acquired and things didn't go well and there were closures uh, and reputations of brands were damaged as a result. So that trust becomes, uh, becomes super important. Hey guys, moving forward, we're all, and we are moving forward in terms of time on our show as well, but moving forward into 2021, everybody is talking about vaccines and talking about getting back to some level of normality. How do you guys see that situation? And do you see vaccines starting to impact um, work and life in, um, in Europe in the coming, in the coming months? Rainer, perhaps you want to tackle that first. I mean, uh, in, in very simple word, word I, mean, I, I think for the electronics industry in, in, in Europe in total, um, you know, in simple words, uh, you know, it's going to be beautiful. I think it's really going to be beautiful. I think it could be comparable with the year 2018. 
and I'm deeply convinced, uh, you know, of that fact. There are only, let me say, two pitfalls uh, there. The first one is if you are, I mean, we are in a 90% economy right now, meaning 90% of the economy are running quite well. Um, and then there are 10% and those 10%, they are still in deep shit and they will be in deep shit for another two to three quarters at least. And that's about, I mean, uh, aerospace, uh, you know, travel, some parts of consumer, etc. cetera. So but th th what, what does it mean? It means if you are um, overly focused on, on those industries as an electronics uh, company, then uh, you will maybe not be part of the party 2021 um, as you cannot you know, change uh, so fast. And the second pitfall is that what we are seeing is because all of the industries, they are, I mean, kind of restarting right now. We are seeing that uh, we will have some big, big, big problems um, in the supply chain, um, you know, both in the uh, logistics, in the transportation area, as well as that we will have shortages and very, very long lead times um, in, in certain parts, um, uh, which uh, um, uh, regards to, with regards to the material. And, you know, that's already starting right now. And so proper forecasting uh, together with your customers is of, it, is of essence there. But I mean, apart from those two um, big, uh, let me say, um, um, things that could, uh, 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 that could um, give some, uh, some headwinds, um, everything I think will be, uh, will be great, including automotive industry, to be very precise mm -hmm. on that. Okay, Dieter. Yeah. Data. Yeah. Um, let me just reflect a little bit of the vaccination uh, situation over here in Germany at the moment. Uh, we have 1.3 million shots uh, of vaccine at the moment over here. We started with the vaccination on December 27th, which is uh, uh, before, uh, 11 days uh, uh, as of now. Uh, and we achieved a vaccination rate of 0.44%, which is six, uh, 367,000 shots. And that is just 28% of the shots which are available yeah, since 11 days. And people are getting rightly impatient. Yeah? If we continue the present speed of vaccination, we will not achieve herd immunity uh, until the end of the year. Israel, the USA, and the UK show us that it can be done much faster. On the other hand, France and the Netherlands show us how we shouldn't do it. Now, there is pressure developing on the politicians in charge in, in presence. Uh, people tell them they should have better watched Star Trek on TV to know what warp speed means. Yeah? And uh, in consequence, the prime minister of Bavaria today exchanged the Bavarian minister of health yeah, as a consequence. So we can only hope uh, that uh, we see an increase on in speed. People expect that we get back to nearly normal life again by the end of May. In order to achieve this, the vaccination speed needs to increase 10 times, which is possible, but it is challenging. Uh, we will continue to see a recovery of the European industry. Even so, depending on the size of the company and the market serve, it could well be that they will have to wait until the mid of 2022 before they see similar revenues than 2019. And there will definitely be more companies which will not survive until then. Yeah. So thank you for that. Let me just maybe wrap here with a quick question. You know, your prediction looking forward for 2021 and beyond. I know you, you defined it as beautiful. Um, and, uh, you know, Edita, you know, you had some optimism there in your comments as well. So maybe, Raina, start with you. What is kind of your predictions for, for the European EMS market this decade? This decade? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think this, this decade um, will 
if I look into the past, and if I look into the past with all the numbers that also Dieter and Informa uh, published, I mean, my, uh, my personal view is that we will very soon come back to the uh, growth path, which we've seen over the last uh, five to 10 years in our industry. So I don't see any reasons or signals why this should slow down because the, the, over, the, the overarching trend, which is uh, the electronification of everything uh, in, in the world, I mean, this will go on. And as um, we have so many uh, beautiful companies in Europe, uh, which are producing all kinds of things. So the production uh, companies are, are there and they are growing in all, in all industries. And all those products have electronics in it. So there's absolutely no reason why there shouldn't be uh, some kind of golden ages for electronics companies also in the future. There's, a, there, there's my, my only but is, but the, uh, let me say, consolidation of the market there, this has to be continued because right now the industry structure in Europe is still too weak in order to, uh, to fulfill the demands and not only in terms of volume, but also in terms of uh, solidity, in terms of... Uh, in terms of uh, quality and sustainability from the customers. So that's the only thing. The consolidation has to go on and has to go on in a, let me say, very solid um, and meaningful way in order to make this uh, uh, European um, electronics um, industry as strong as they deserve. And by the way, I do realize that asking you for a prediction for 10 years is, is, a, is a bold one, yeah. The further out you go, the, the less sure we are. I understand how that goes, but you know, it's the beginning of the year and you know, hope springs eternal, right? So uh, Dito, what's your view of it, sir? Well, I think first of all, most companies have learned from 2020 and those who have not, they will get into trouble shortly. Uh, we will see a rapid acceleration of innovation in the next decade. Even so, people tell me that the automotive industry is picking up and will accelerate in the move to electric vehicles and the migration of 48 volt systems. Uh, I do not agree on that. The growth in the past has been supported strongly by the increased amount of electronics in the past. But uh, we are now at the level or at the point uh, where this is saturated and people start adding useless electronic gimmicks in cars just to sell something. Mm -hmm. uh, during the pandemic, uh, the transportation declined tremendously and it will not return to pre-pandemic times again. I cannot see a dramatic pickup of car sales neither in 2021 nor in 2022. But what I do see is digitalization, automation, robotics, high performance computing, um, defense, and agriculture technology will be the growth Peter, drivers Peter. in the near future. In addition, we need to rethink supply chains and avoid dependence on single countries, especially in times of political uncertainty. And that yeah. uh, are the challenging things uh, uh, which we uh, gonna see. We will see a fundamental change in the behavior of consumers and brands. With one exception, people want to get back the freedom of travel. At least the European EMS industry is very progressive to improve the marketing and the degree of awareness of the EMS industry. And I'm helping the European EMS industry as their ambassador. To all OEMs who are watching now uh, and who have not realized it as of now, you can save lots of money by transferring the production of your product to the professionals of the EMS industry in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and that plays and right there back. There are many companies, and you just need to contact them. Yeah, uh, have a look at the new uh, homepage, EMS Scout. 
uh, on the internet and you will first uh, get a first overview of uh, the many EMS companies in Germany, Austria and Switzerland that are available there to serve you. So uh, it yeah. is all there. Yeah? Yeah. Shut down your production. Yeah? <laughs> uh, make it easy for yourself. <laughs> yeah? That's the message I have for you. Well, that's a, sol that's a solid message, and that plays right back to your your um, your decade of outsourcing, which I think is really exciting. And I think you're you're both right in that we've got a decade of accelerated innovation coming along. The um, the digital transformation of just about every industry is going to have an impact and create more and more demand. And uh, there's a whole lot of disruption. Happening. I'm really looking forward to the 2031 edition of this show, where we can uh, we can look back on these predictions and and uh, with our with our grey hair um, and and see and see how we did. But yeah, I think um, I think we're in for an exciting decade, and I think we're in for a really interesting 2021 in the short term, where we where we do come to terms with what's happening and we do. Um, you know, figure out what the what the new normal, what the new the new landscape will be, and what opportunities that presents. So, yeah, exciting times ahead. Yeah, Eric. Yes. Well, it's my job to wrap this, um, gentlemen. Thank you very much, as always. Um, it's always good to to catch up with you. This was a great discussion. Uh, I think we can't end the show without saying that Raina does win the award for the most interesting background during this webinar here today. So uh, yeah. <laughs> we all have to up our game a little bit in the future, I think, but absolutely. Um, but thank you, gentlemen, both. Hopefully we can revisit some of these issues as the year progresses as well. Uh, yep. and hopefully by the second half of the year, maybe we could even revisit some of this in person. So yeah, that would um, be wonderful. Thank you to everyone who's been listening to this. Um, we have more of these shows scheduled and planned for throughout the year on a twice monthly basis. So please look for those invitations and uh, join us when you can. Gentlemen, thank you. I wish you a good 2021. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye.